And we are up. And good evening, everybody. It's December 12th, 2020. It's time for the finale of Star Trek Radio Theater here on Live Long and Podcast. It's been a long season, everybody. And we're going out with a bang tonight. We're doing Star Trek for The Voyage Home. First time we've ever done a movie. Uh, thanks for you who have maybe been waiting uh, up, you know, maybe 15, 16 minutes for us to go live. This is quite the production, you know, week to week we do an, an episode. This is the first time we've done a movie, so there's a lot more involved. We got the biggest cast ever. I'm so excited to bring this to you, and uh, and we all are. There's been uh, – everybody's put uh, had a hand in putting this together, so uh, I'm not going to ramble any longer. Let's just get the show going and dive right in. We really hope you enjoy this. Okay, and starting now. <laughs> The cast and crew of Star Trek Radio Theater wish to dedicate this reading to the men and women of the spaceship Challenger, whose courageous spirit shall live to the 23rd century and beyond. Starring Kevin Millard as Admiral James T. Kirk. Renick. Tom Mott Tyrell as Captain Spock. And also as intern number two. Jessica Chan as Dr. Jillian Taylor and Amanda Grayson. Co-starring Jane Mader as Dr. Leonard McCoy, and also as Saratoga Captain Passerby Jogger. Jody Simpson as Captain Montgomery Scott, and also as Marine Sergeant and Doctor Number Four. Michael Chan as Commander Harkaru Sulu and Ambassador Sarek, and also as the CDO, Doctor Number Three. Intern number one. Oh, man. Saratoga science officer, Starfleet communications officer, Tenoy voice, and waiter. <laughs> Ashley Millard as Commander Niota Uhura and Lieutenant Savick. And also as the narrator, Doctor number two, Roman patient, radar operator, Starfleet voice. Jeff Mater as Commander Pavel Chekhov and Fleet Admiral Cartwright, and also as Doctor Number One, Yorktown Captain, Helicopter Pilot, Marines Lieutenant, Saratoga Helmsman, Starfleet Aide, Commander Christine Chapel, with Dave Mader as the Klingon Ambassador, Bob Briggs, an FBI agent and antique store owner, as well as Garbage Man One, Test Computer Voice, Police Number One, and various others, and introducing Jamil Robinson as the Federation President and Doctor Nichols. And also as garbage man number two, taxi driver, Starfleet voice, electronic technicians, and policeman number two, civilian agent, and various others. Story by Leonard Nimoy and Harv Bennett. Screenplay by Steve Mearson, Peter Kreikis, Harvey Bennett, and Nicholas Meyer. <laughs> We focus on the USS Saratoga Bridge. A probe of unknown origin is flying through space. The Saratoga is scanning it with various instruments. What do you make of it? It appears to be a probe, Captain, from an intelligence unknown to us. Continue transmitting. Universal peace and hello in all known languages. Get me Starfleet Command. Ready, Captain. Starfleet Command. This is the USS Saratoga patrolling Sector 5 Neutral Zone. We are attacking a probe of unknown origin on apparent trajectory to the Terran solar system. Attempts to communicate with the probe have been negative on all known frequencies. Continue tracking, Saratoga. We will analyze transmissions and advise. Roger, Starfleet. Saratoga out. We focus on the Federation Council Chamber. We see a clip of a Klingon crew on the view screen in the chamber. Six, five, four, three, two, one. The image cuts to the Enterprise, catching fire and exploding in space. Finally, we see Admiral Kirk on screen. We pan out to see the chamber filled with members of the Federation and Starfleet. A Klingon ambassador stands in the front of the chamber and addresses the room. Hold the image! Hold! B-52 
Behold, the quintessential devil in these matters, James T. Kirk, renegade and terrorist. Not only is he responsible for the murder of a Klingon crew, the theft of a Klingon vessel, now the real plot and intentions. Even as this Federation was negotiating a peace treaty with us, Kirk was secretly developing the Genesis torpedo, conceived by Kirk's son and test detonated by the Admiral himself. The results of this awesome energy was euphemistically called the Genesis Planet, a secret base from which to launch the annihilation of the Klingon people. We demand the extradition of Kirk. We demand justice. Klingon justice is a unique point of view, Mr. President. There is a gasp as Sarek enters the Federation Council Chamber. Oh my gosh. Oh my. Oh dear. Genesis was perfectly named the creation of life, not death. The Klingon shed the first blood while attempting to possess its secrets. Vulcans are well known as the intellectual puppets of this Federation. Your vessel did destroy USS Grissom. Your men did kill Kirk's son. Do you deny these events? We deny nothing. We have the right to preserve our race. Do you have the right to commit murder? The council chambers are astir at Sarek's boldness. <gasps> oh, oh my. Oh. <laughs> Silence! Silence. There will be no further outbursts on the floor. Mr. President, I have come to speak on behalf of the accused. Personal bias! His son was saved by Kirk! Mr. Ambassador, will all respect the Counselor's deliberations are over. Then Kirk goes unpunished? Admiral Kirk has been charged with nine violations of Starfleet regulations. Starfleet regulations? That's outrageous! Remember this well. There shall be no peace as long as Kirk lives. With that, the Klingon ambassador turns and storms out of the council chambers. Captain's Log, Stardate 8390. We are in the third month of our Vulcan exile, and it was Dr. McCoy, with a fine sense of historical irony, who decided on a name for our captured Klingon vessel. HMS Bounty is roughly painted in large red capital letters along the side of the Bird of Prey. And like those mutineers of 500 years ago, we too have a hard choice to make. We focus on Vulcan, Bird of Prey on a landing pad. The crew is lined up along the side of the ship. Kirk makes his way down the line. Dr. McCoy? Aye, sir. Mr. Scott? Aye, sir. Uhura? Aye, sir. Chekhov? Aye, sir. Sulu? Aye, sir. Let the record show that the commander and the crew of the late Starship Enterprise have voted unanimously to return to Earth to face the consequences of their actions in the rescue of their comrade, Captain Spock. Thank you all. Repair stations, please. The crew begins to leave. Mr. Scott. Aye, sir. How soon can we be underway? Give me one more day, sir. Damage control is easy. Reading Klingon. That's hard. You'd think they could at least send up ship. It's bad enough to be court-martialed and spend the rest of our lives being mining borite, but to go home in this Klingon flea trap? We could learn a thing or two from this flea trap. It's got a cloaking device that costs us a lot. I just wish we could cloak the stench. McCoy heads to the ship. Kirk pauses and looks up to the rocky ledge above them where Spock is standing, looking glorious in his long white robe. We focus on Spock's test chamber. Spock enters and heads to the computers. He has several going at once and enter answers both verbally and by typing his answers on the keyboard. Computer, resume testing. Who said logic is the cement of our civilization, with which we ascend from chaos within reason as our guide? Kaplan, huh? Measure of Vulcan philosophy. Correct. What is the molecular formula of the aluminum sulfite crystal? Spock types the formula into the computer. Correct. White queen to section five, queen six. Queen takes knight. Rook takes queen. White pawn to section five, queen seven. Pawn takes rook. Checkmate. 
Correct. What is the significant co contribution to the bioengineering was made on the Lunarian outpost on Clendet? The Universal Atmospheric Element Compensator. Abali when conclude, a starship sensors indicate it is being pursued so closely that it occupies the same space as its pursuer. Correct. Identify object and its cultural significance. I got a mum of cakes and glyph. Correct. What was the principal historical event on the planet Earth in the year 1987? Correct. What is the carrier kin cause thirst laws of metaphysics? Nothing real exists. Correct. Adjust the sine wave of this magnetic envelope so that anti neurons can pass through it, but anti gravins cannot. Correct. What is the electronic configuration of gadolinium? Correct. How do you feel? This question causes Spock to pause. How do you feel? I do not understand the question. What is it, Spock? Spock turns at the sound of his mother's voice coming from the doorway. I do not understand the question, Mother. You're half human. The computer knows that. The question is irrelevant. Spock, the retraining of your mind has been in the Vulcan way, so you may not understand feelings. But as my son, you have them. They will surface. Yeah, as you wish, since you deem them of value. But I cannot wait here to find them. Why? Where must you go? I must go to Earth to offer testimony. You do this for friendship? I do it because I was there. Spock, does the good of the many outweigh the good of the one? I would accept that as an axiom. Then you stand here alive because of a mistake made by your flawed, feeling human friends. They have sacrificed their futures because they believe that the good of the one, you, was more important to them. Humans make illogical decisions. They do indeed. We focus on the Saratoga Bridge. The strange sounds coming from the probe are getting louder and more intense. The crew of the Saratoga read their instruments. Here it comes now! What's causing that? Their call is being carried on an amplification wave of enormous power! Can you isolate the wave? Negative! It's impacting on all our systems! Yellow alert! Shields up! Helm, reduce closing speed. Thruster controls have been neutralized! Emergency thrusters! No response, Captain! The ship is losing power, and there are sparks coming out of several of the stations. Emergency lights! Damage report! All systems have failed! We are functioning on reserve power only! Starfleet Command, this is Saratoga. Can you hear me? Come in, please! Come in, please! The probe is flying past the Saratoga, which is now dead in space. The probe is several times larger than the ship. <laughs> We focus on Starfleet Command. There are lots of Starfleet personnel hustling about, busy reading reports and interpreting scans of the probe. Thank you, sir. Status report, Admiral. Not good. Mr. President, the probe is headed directly for us. The signal is damaging everything in its path. The Klingons have lost two vessels, two starships, and three smaller vessels, and have been neutralized. Neutralized? How? We don't know. Get me the Yorktown. Emergency channel 0123, code red. It has been three hours since our contact with the alien probe. All attempts at regaining power have failed. It's using forms of energy we don't understand. Can you protect us? We are launching everything we have. Our chief engineer is trying to deploy a makeshift solar sail. We have high hopes that this will, if successful, Generate enough power to keep us alive! We focus on the Bird of Prey bridge. The Enterprise crew is still busy making repairs. Kirk enters. Systems report? Communications? Communication systems are ready, sir. Communications officer is as ready as she'll ever be. Mr. Sulu? Guidance is functional. Onboard computer will interface with Federation Memory Bank. Weapon system? Operational, Admiral. 
cloaking device now available on all flight modes. I'm impressed. That's a lot of work for a short voyage. We are in an enemy vessel, sir. I didn't wish to be shot down on the way to our funeral. Most prudent. Engine room. Report, Mr. Scott. We focus on bird of prey engineering. We're ready, sir. I've converted the dilithium sequencer into something a little less primitive. And Admiral, I have replaced the Klingon food packs. They were giving me a sour stomach. Oh, is that what it was? Prepare for departure. Everybody not going to Earth had better get off. Savik, this is goodbye. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir, I have not had the opportunity to tell you about your son. David died most bravely. He saved Spock. He saved us all. I thought you should know. Spock enters the bridge. Good day, Captain Spock. May your journey be free of incident. Live long and prosper, Lieutenant. Savick leaves and Spock walks over to Kirk. Permission to come aboard. Permission granted. Thank you, Admiral. Jim. Spock, Jim, don't you remember? It would not be proper to refer to you as Jim while you are in command, Admiral. Also, I must apologize for my attire. I seem to have misplaced my uniform. Station. Are you sure this is such a bright idea? What do you mean? I mean him. Back at his post, like nothing happened. I don't know if you've got the whole picture or not, but he's not exactly working on all thrusters. It'll come back to him. Are you sure? Kirk sits down in the captain's chair, looking discouraged. That's what I thought. Mr. Sulu, take us home. Thrusters functional. One quarter impulse power. The bounty t- takes off from the landing dock and slowly makes its way off of the planet surface as Savick, Amanda Grayson, and several other Vulcans watch from a distance. We focus on a space dock. The probe is making its way past. Space dock, this is Starfleet Command. Launch all vessels. Launch all vessels. Sir, space dock doors are inoperative. All emergency systems are non-functional. Engage emergency reserve power. Aye, sir. Starfleet Command. This is Space Dock on Emergency Channel. We've lost all internal power. The Space Dock and several shuttlecrafts lose power. The probe continues to travel through space and stops as it reaches Earth. It sends out several more blasts of the unidentified sound. Suddenly, there are storm clouds forming over the ocean as the water begins to spurt upwards. The sky darkens. We focus on the Bird of Prey Bridge. Estimating planet Earth, 1.6 hours present speed. Continue on course. Mr. Chekhov, any signs of a Federation escort? No, sir. And no Federation vessels on assigned patrol stations. That's odd. Ahura, what's on the comm channels? Very active, sir. Multiphasic transmissions overlapping. It's almost a gibberish. Let me see if I can sort it out. McCoy comes over and sits next to Spock. Ha! Busy? Your whore is busy. I am monitoring. Hmm. Well, I just wanted to say it sure is nice to have your Katra back in your head, not mine. What I mean is, I may have carried your soul, but I sure couldn't feel your shoes. My shoes? Forget it. Perhaps we could cover philosophical ground. Life, death, life, things of that nature. I did not have time on Vulcan to review philosophical disciplines. 
Come on, Spock, it's me, McCoy. You really have gone where no man has gone before. Can you tell me what it felt like? It would be impossible to discuss the subject without a common frame of reference. You're joking. A joke is a story with a humorous climax. You mean I have to die to discuss your insights on death? Forgive me, Doctor. I am receiving a number of distress calls. No doubt about it. We focus on Starfleet Command. The probe is affecting Earth's oceans and weather more violently. There is thunder and lightning and hurricane conditions forming. You know, Alaska, clouds increasing to 95 percent. Tokyo, cloud, total cloud coverage. All power is from reserve banks. Leningrad has lost all electrical power. Cloud cover 100 percent. Temperatures decreasing rapidly. What is the estimated cloud cover of the planet at this time? 78.6%. Notify all stations. Starfleet emergency. Switch power immediately to planetary reserves. Mr. President, even with planetary reserves, we cannot survive without the sun. I am well aware of that, Admiral. Sarek enters. Admiral Sarek. I'm afraid you trapped here with us. There seems to be no way we can answer this probe. It is difficult to answer when one does not understand the question, Mr. President. Perhaps you should transmit a planetary distress signal while we still have time. The President nods in agreement. We focus on the Bird of Prey bridge. Admiral? What is it? Overlapping distress calls, and now a message coming in from the Federation. On screen. This is the President of the United Federation of Planets. Do not approach Earth. The transmissions of an orbiting probe are causing critical damage to this planet. It has almost totally ionized our atmosphere. All power sources have failed. All orbiting starships are powerless. The probe is vaporizing our oceans. We cannot survive unless a way can be found to respond to this probe. Further communications may not be possible. Save your energy. Save yourselves. Avoid planet Earth at all costs. Farewell. Uhura, let's hear the probe's transmission. Yes, sir. On speakers. Spock, what do you make of that? Most unusual. An unknown form of energy of great power and intelligence. Evidently unaware that its transmissions are disruptive. I find it illogical that its intentions should be hostile. Really? You think that this is its way of saying hi there to the people of Earth? There are other forms of intelligence on Earth, Doctor. Only human arrogance would assume the message was meant for man. You're suggesting the transmission is meant for a life form other than man? It's a possibility, Admiral. The President did say it was directed at Earth's oceans. Ahura, can you modify the probe's signal accounting for density and temperature and salinity factors? I can try, sir. Uhura begins to press buttons and turn knobs, attempting to adjust the message being sent out by the probe. I think I have it, sir. And this is what it would sound like underwater? Yes, sir. Fascinating. If my suspicion is correct, there could be no response to this message. Excuse me. Where are you going? To test my theory. Spock leaves the bridge, and Kirk and Bones follow. Bones, you stay here. No way! Somebody's gotta keep an eye on him! We focus on the Bird of Prey computer room. Spock is searching through the computer database. <laughs> 
various images of Earth's sea creatures move across the screen. The images stop on an image of a humpback whale. <laughs> Spock? As suspected, the probe's transmissions are the songs by these whales. Whales? Specifically humpback whales. That's crazy. Who would send a probe hundreds of light years to talk to a whale? It's possible. Whales have been on Earth far earlier than man. Ten million years earlier. And humpbacks were heavily hunted by man. They've been extinct since the 21st century. It's possible that alien intelligence sent the probe to determine why they lost count of. My god. Spock, could the humpback's answer to this be simulated? The sounds, but not the language. We would be responding in gibberish. Does this species exist on any other planet? Negative. Humpbacks are indigenous to Earth. Earth of the past. Then we have no choice. We must destroy the probe before it destroys Earth. To attempt so would be futile. Uh, the probe would render us neutral easily. But we can't turn away. There must be an alternative. There is one possibility, but of course I cannot guarantee its success. We could attempt to find some humpback whales. You just said there aren't any, except on Earth of the past. Yes, Doctor, that is exactly what I said. Well, in that case, now wait just a damn minute. Spock, start your computations for time warp. Bones, you come with me. We focus on Starfleet Command. Everyone is scrambling. Monitors on the wall are showing Earth's extreme weather. Another monitor is at red alert. Red alert. Red alert. Red alert. Admiral, we need that power to keep the medical and emergency systems functioning. All underground storage systems have been shut down. Red alert. Red alert. Red alert. Red alert. The chaotic scene continues as engineers try to reinforce a large window. We focus on the bird of prey cargo bay. Kirk, Scotty, and Bones are checking it out. Scotty, how long is this bay? About six feet, Admiral. Can you enclose it to hold water? I suppose I could. Are you planning to take a swim? Off the deep end, Mr. Scott. Scotty, we've got to find some humpbacks. Humpbacked people? Whales, Mr. Scott. Whales. 45 to 50 feet long, about 40 tons each. Kirk and McCoy leave the cargo bay. We focus on the bird of prey corridor. Are you really going to try this time travel in this rust bucket? We've done it before. Sure. Slingshot around the sun. If you pick up enough speed, you're in time warp. If you don't, you fry. Would you prefer to do nothing? I'd prefer a dose of common sense. You are proposing to head backwards in time, find humpback whales, then bring them forward in time, drop them off, and hope to hell they tell this probe what to go do with it itself. That's the general idea. That's crazy! You have a better idea. Now's the time. We focus on the Bird of Prey bridge. The computations, Mr. Spock? In progress, Admiral. Uhura, get me through to Starfleet Command. We focus on Starfleet Command. The weather has gotten so bad you can barely see the Golden Gate Bridge in the bay. The monitors in the command center are staticky and barely able to process sound or picture. Red alert. I'm picking up a free transmission. I think it's Admiral Kirk going. On screen! Admiral Kirk appears on the large view screen. He's pixelated and glitchy. They can barely make out his message. Starfleet Command. This is Admiral James T. Kirk. We have intercepted and analyzed the call of the probe. Satellite reserve power, now! It is our opinion that only the extinct species, humpback whale, can give the proper response to the probe. Stabilize, emergency reserve! Emergency reserve. We are going to attempt time travel. We are computing our trajectory at this point. The picture blurs again 
and this time Kirk's transmission is lost. Oh, God damn it! Get him back! Get him back! But they can't get him back. In the background, four Starfleet engineers continue to attempt to reinforce one window only in a full row of windows. <laughs> <laughs> the window beside the one they are working on explodes inwards, knocking three of the engineers to the floor. Who could have seen that coming? We focus on the Bird of Prey bridge. Ready to engage computer, Admiral. What's our target in time? Late 20th century. Can you be more specific? Now with this equipment. I've had to program some of the variables from memory. What are some of the variables? Availability of fuel components, mass of the vessel through a time continuum, and the probable location of humpback whales, in this case, the Pacific Basin. You programmed all that from memory? I have. Angels and ministers of grace, defend us. Hamlet, Act 1, C4. No doubt about your memory. Spock, engage computer. Prepare for warp speed. Shields, Mr. Chekhov. Shields, aye. May fortune favor the foolish. Warp speed, Mr. Sulu. Warp two. Warp three. Steady as she goes. Warp four. Warp five. Warp six. Warp seven. Warp eight. Sir! Heat shield at maximum. Warp nine. Warp nine point two. Nine point three. We see the sun directly ahead on the view screen. We need breakaway speed. 9.5, 9.6, 9.7, 9.8. The ship begins to break apart. Uhura nearly gets taken out by an explosion. I'm all right. The sun is getting bigger on the view screen. Now, Mr. Sulu. The ship slingshots around the sun. Suddenly, the ship is filled with a bright light. The voices of the crew can be heard. There is a weird, foggy substance with the heads of the crew floating out of it. I should have never left him. My God, Jim, where are we? You're talking about the end of everybody on Earth. Suddenly, we hear the sounds of whales and we see one flying above the fog. A faceless fogman falls through the sky and into water, and then we're back on the Bird of Prey bridge and the crew is waking up. Mr. Sulu? Mr. Sulu? Mr. Sulu? Aye, sir. What is our condition? Sir, the braking thrusters have fired. Picture, please. A picture of Earth appears on the view screen. Earth? But when? Spock? Judging by the pollution content of the atmosphere, I believe we have arrived at the later half of the 20th century. Well done, Spock. Admiral, if I may, we're probably already visible to the tracking devices of the time. Quite right. Engage cloaking device. Mr. Chekhov? We are crossing the Terminator into night. Coming in on the west coast of North America. Admiral, I'm receiving whale song. Put them on speaker. Admiral, 
This is strange. The song is directly ahead. It's coming from San Francisco. From the city? That doesn't make sense. We focus on the Bird of Prey engineering. Admiral, we have a serious problem. Would you come down? Kirk and Spock head down to engineering to see what's up. Scotty has the latch open with glowing crystals inside. It's these Klingon crystals, Admiral. The time travel drained them. They're giving out decrystallizing. Give me a round figure, Mr. Scott. Oh, 24 hours, give or take. They include. After that, Admiral, we're visible and dead in the water. In any case, we won't have enough to break out of Earth's gravity to say nothing to get back home. I can't believe we've come this far only to be stopped by this. Is there no way to recrystallize dilithium? Sorry, sir. We can't even do that in the 23rd century. Admiral, there may be a 20th century possibility. Explain. If memory serves, there's a dubious flirtation with nuclear fission reactors resulting in toxic side effects. By the beginning of the fusion era, these reactors have been replaced, but at this time, we may be able to find some. I thought you said they were toxic. We could construct a device to collect their high-energy photons safely. These photons could be injected into the dilithium chamber, causing crystalline restructure. Theoretically. Where would we find these reactors? Theoretically. Nuclear power was widely used in naval vessels. We focus on the Bird of Prey Bridge. We see the San Francisco skyline on the view screen. San Francisco. I was born there. It doesn't look all that different. Set us down in Golden Gate Park. Hi, sir. Descending. We'll divide into teams. Ahura and Chekhov are assigned to the uranium problem. Yes, sir. Dr. McCoy, you and Mr. Scott and Commander Sulu will convert us a whale tank. Oh, joy. Well, Captain Spock and I attempt to trace down these whale songs to their source. I'll have bearing and distance for you, sir. I want you all to be very careful. This is Terra Incognita. Many of their customs will doubtless take us by surprise. It's a foregone conclusion that none of these people have ever seen an extraterrestrial before. Spock tears off part of his robe. And ties it around his forehead and over his ears. This is an extremely primitive and paranoid culture. Mr. Chekhov will issue a phaser and communicator to each team. We'll maintain radio silence except in emergencies. Those of you in uniform, remove your rank, and ins rank insignia. Any questions? All right, let's do our job and get out of here. Our own world is waiting for us to save it, if we can. Commence landing procedure. Aye, sir. We focus on Golden Gate Park. Two garbage men are busy emptying garbage cans into the back of their truck. You don't mean to tell me you two were fighting again. I thought you'd made it up with her last night. Why are you two always fighting? I like the way she fights. Anyways, I said to her, if you think I'm going to spend $60 on a damn toaster oven, you're out of your mind. What did she say to that? Well, a wind blows the garbage cans and garbage around the park. An empty bin falls over on its side and rolls onto the grassy area. The bin and surrounding grass area are flattened by an unseen object. What the hell was that? The ramp for the bird of prey opens up and the crew begins to walk out of what appears to be thin air. Did you see that? No, and neither did you, so shut up! The garbage men jump into their truck and drive away. Bearing to the whales? 283 degrees, 15.2 kilometers. 
Everyone remember where we parked. We focus on San Francisco, downtown. The crew is navigating the busy 20th century streets. They walk out into the street without looking and Kirk almost gets hit by a cab. Hey! Hey! Why don't you watch where you're going, dumbass? Whoa, well, well, double dumbass on you! It's a miracle these people ever got out of the 20th century. They're still using money. We've got to find some. Spock. The rest of you stay here. The rest of you break up. You look like a cadet review. The rest of the crew begins to walk away, trying to fit in awkwardly and looking confused about what to do next. We focus on an antique store. The owner of the store is looking at a pair of old glasses Kirk is attempting to sell. Yes, they're 18th century American, quite. Valuable. Are you sure you want to part with them? How much will you give me for them? Excuse me, weren't they a birthday present for Dr. McCoy? And they will be again, that's the beauty of it. How much? Well, they'd be worth more if the lenses were intact. I'll give you $100. Is that a lot? The Hmm. antique store owner just shrugs. We focus on San Francisco downtown. Kirk is splitting up the money with the rest of the crew. That's all there is. Don't splurge. All set? Good hunting. The crew splits up into their three groups and heads off into different directions. Well, Spock, here we are. Thanks to your restored memory and a little bit of good luck, we're walking the streets of San Francisco looking for a couple of humpback whales. How do you propose to solve this minor problem? Simple logic will suffice. I believe I shall begin making use of this map. I have the distance and bearing which were provided by Commander Yohora. If we juxtapose our coordinates, we should be able to find our destination. It lies at 283.7 degrees. A bus with an advertisement for the Cetacean Institute on the side pulls up beside them. I think we'll find what we're looking for at the Cetacean Institute in Sausalito. A pair of humpbacks named George and Gracie. How do you know this? Simple logic. They board the bus. And then immediately get off the bus. What does it mean? Exact change. Kirk shrugs and the two start to walk away. We focus on San Francisco, another street. McCoy, Scott, and Sulu are walking down a sidewalk. Would you mind telling me how we plan to convert this tank? Ordinarily, I could do it with a piece of transparent aluminum. I'm afraid you're a number of years too early for that. I know. We've got to find the 20th century equivalent. But where? The three turn around and see a large ad for the yellow pages on the building behind them. This gives them an idea. We focus on San Francisco, elsewhere. Uhura and Chekhov are at a phone booth looking at the phone book. Did you find it? Yes, under U.S. government. Now we need directions. They see a policeman behind them and approach him. Excuse me, sir. Can you direct me to the naval base in Alameda? It's where they keep all the nuclear vessels. The officer just stares at them, and they give up on him and begin to ask random people walking on the street. Nuclear vessels. No one seems to want to help. Excuse us. Excuse me. We are looking for nuclear vessels. Can you tell me where the naval base is? In Alameda. The officer just continues to watch this scene. Hello. We are looking for the nuclear vessels in Alameda. Could you tell me where the... Uhura stops a random lady walking by. Can you help us? We are looking for the naval base in Alameda. Could you tell me where the nuclear vessels are? Ooh. 
I don't know if I know the answer to that. I think it's across the bay in Alameda. She walks off. That's what I said. Alameda. Alameda. I know that. But where is Alameda? We focus on a bus. A punk with a mohawk and several piercings is listening to loud music on a large boombox. Just where is the future? The things we don't extend. Let's just push the button. We'd be better off dead. Cause I hate you. The passengers on the bus are not happy. Excuse me. Excuse me. Would you mind stopping that noise? The punk turns the sound up on his ghetto blaster. The sins of all our fathers, they dumped on us the sun. Excuse me. Would you mind stopping that damn noise? The punk gives Kirk the finger. Spock reaches across the bus and gives the punk a nerve pinch. We're all bloody wetless. <laughs> Stopping the noise and gaining a round of applause and cheers from the passengers. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chinese guy. Good job. Admiral, may I ask you a question? Spock, don't call me Admiral. You used to call me Jim. Don't you remember? Jim. What's your question? Your use of language has altered since our arrival. It's currently laced with, shall I say, more colorful metaphors. Double dumbass on you, and so forth. You mean the profanity? That's simply the way they talk here. Nobody pays attention to you unless you swear every other word. You'll find it in all the literature of the period. For example? Oh, the collective works of Jacqueline Suzanne, the novels of Harold Robbins. Ah... Uh, Giants. We focus on the Cetacean Institute. Spock and Kirk exit the bus and make their way into the Institute. The next shilling of The Wonderful World of Wales will begin in five minutes in the Marine Theater. A woman in a peach suit approaches the group of people gathered for the next tour. Kirk and Spock join the group. Here I go. Good morning. I'm your guide this morning. My name is Dr. Jillian Taylor, but you can call me Jillian. I'm assistant director of the Maritime Cetacean Institute. So please follow me and just give a yell if you can't hear me, okay? Dr. Jillian begins to lead the tour through the museum. The Cetacean Institute is the only museum in the world exclusively devoted to whales. As you can see, we have a great deal to offer, but that is small compared to what we know, or rather what we don't know, about whales. The first commonly held misconception is that whales are fish. They're not. They're mammals, just like you and me. Warm-blooded, needing air to breathe, and producing milk to nurse their young. Whoa! Do whales attack people like Moby Dick? No, no. Most whales don't even have teeth. They have a soft gum-like tissue that strains vast amounts of tiny shrimp for food, and that is the limit of their hostility. Unfortunately, their principal enemy is far, far more aggressive. You mean man. To put it mildly, since the dawn of time, men have harvested whales for a variety of purposes, most of which can be achieved synthetically at this point. 100 years ago, using hand-thrown harpoons, man did plenty of damage, but that is nothing compared to what he has achieved in this century. This is mankind's legacy, whales hunted to the brink of extinction. Virtually gone is the blue whale, the largest creature ever to inhabit the earth. Despite all attempts at banning whaling, there are still countries and pirates currently engaged in the slaughter of these inoffensive creatures. Where the humpback whale once numbered in the hundreds of thousands, today there are less than 10,000 specimens alive, and those that are taken are no longer fully grown. In addition, many of the females are killed while still bearing unborn calves. To hunt a species to extinction is not logical. Whoever said the human race was logical. Now, if you'll follow me, please, I'll introduce you to the Institute's pride and joy. We focus on the whale tank outside. This is the largest seawater tank in the world, and it contains the only two humpback whales in captivity. They are mature humpbacks weighing 45,000 pounds each. They wandered into San Francisco Bay as calves and were brought here. We call them George and Gracie. It's perfect, Spock. A male and a female humpback in a contained space. We beam them up together and consider ourselves lucky. Beautiful, aren't they? And extremely intelligent. Now, you'll follow me, please. We focus on the Institute inside. 
The group is making their way down a flight of stairs. Despite all the things that they are teaching us, we have to return George and Gracie to the open sea. Why is that? Well, for one thing, we simply don't have enough money to keep feeding them two tons of shrimp per day. How soon? Soon. It's too bad because they're really quite friendly, as you can see. I've grown quite attached to them, and now... Here's a much better way to see George and Gracie. Underwater. We focus on the whale tank. The underwater window. <laughs> what you're hearing is recorded whale song. It is sung by the male. <laughs> He'll sing anywhere from six to as long as 30 minutes and then start again. <laughs> in the ocean, the other whales will pick up the song and pass it on. Spock is seen swimming in the underwater tank, mind melding with the whales. Kirk is shocked and embarrassed, not knowing what to do. The songs change every year, but we still don't know what purpose they serve. Are they some kind of navigational signal? Could they be part of the mating ritual? Or is it pure communication beyond our comprehension? Frankly, we don't know. Maybe we'll say to that man! Jillian turns around and sees Spock swimming with her whales. What the hell? Excuse me, wait right here. Jillian leaves the group and runs up the stairs to the surface of the whale tank. Kirk follows. We focus on the whale tank outside. Spock has surfaced and is now putting his robe back on. All right, who the hell are you? What were you doing in there? Yeah, speak up. Attempting the hell to communicate. Communicate? Communicate what? You have no right to be here. You heard the lady. Admiral, if we were to assume these whales are ours to do with as we please, we would be as guilty as those who caused their extinction. Okay, I don't know what this is all about, but I want you guys out of here right now or I'll call the cops. I assure you that won't be necessary. We were only trying to help. The hell you were, Buster. Your friend was messing up my tank and messing up my whales. They like you very much, but they are not the hell your whales. I, I suppose they told you that, huh? The hell they did. Right. <laughs> We focus on a road near the Cetacean Institute. Spock and Kirk are walking by the Golden Gate Bridge. Spock? Yes? About those colorful metaphors we discussed, I don't think you should try using them anymore. Why not? Well, for one thing, you haven't quite got the knack of it. I see. And another thing, it's not always necessary to tell the truth. I cannot tell a lie. I don't mean lie, but you could... Exaggerate. Exaggerate? Exaggerate! You've done it before! Can't you remember? The hell I can't. What else did you learn from your mind meld? They're unhappy about the way their species have been treated by man. They have a right to be. Are they going to help us? I believe I was successful in communicating our intentions. I see. We focus on the whale tank, outside. Jillian is watching the whales swim and is speaking to them. It's all right. Yes, I know. It's okay. They didn't mean any harm. A man in a tie and a name tag wanders over to her. It's Dr. Bob Briggs, director of the Cetacean Institute. Heard there was some excitement. Ah, uh, just a couple of kooks. How are you doing? I'm fine. Don't tell me your fish stories, kiddo. I've known you too long. Bob, it's tearing me apart, okay? I know. I feel the same. But we're stuck but between a rock and a hard place. We can't keep them here without risking their lives. We can't let them go without taking the same chance. I know, I know. And besides, we're not talking about human beings here. It's never been proven their intelligence is in any way. Oh, come on, Bob. I don't know about you, but my compassion for someone is not limited to my estimate of their intelligence. She storms away, pissed off. We focus on Alameda Naval Base. Chekhov and Uhura are crossing the beach. They spot the base and a large ship. Chekhov pulls out his communicator. Team leader, this is team two. Come in, please. I have the coordinates of the reactor. Kirk here. Admiral, we have found the nuclear vessel. Well done, team two. And Admiral, it is the Enterprise. Understood. What's your plan? We will beam in tonight, collect the photons, and beam out. No one will ever know we were there. We focus on a road near the Cetacean Institute. Understood and approved. Keep me informed. Kirk out. Kirk spots Jillian driving by in an old blue truck. 
She spots them as well and stops. There she is, from the Institute. If we play our cards right, we may be able to find out when those whales are leaving. How will playing cards help? Well, if it isn't Robert and then Fire Talk, where's your fellas heading? Back to San Francisco. Came all the way down here just to jump in and swim with the bodies, eh? There's very little point in me trying to explain. Well, hey, I'll buy that. What about him? Kirk and Spock walk over to the truck. Him? He's harmless. Back in the 60s, he was part of the free speech movement at Berkeley. I think he had a little too much LDS. LDS? Come on, why don't you give me a lift and I'll give you one. I have a notorious weakness for hard luck cases. That's why I work with whales. We don't want to be any trouble. You've already been that. Come on. We focus on the cab of Jillian's pickup. Well, thank you very much. Don't mention it. And don't try anything either. I got time now right where I can get at you. So, you're at all Berkeley? I was not. Memory problems, too. What about you? Where are you from? Iowa. Oh, a landlubber. Come on. What the hell were you guys really trying to do back there? wasn't some kind of macho thing, was it? Because if that's all, I'd be real disappointed. I really hate that macho stuff. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. What happened to your voice? To What's going to happen when you release the whales? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're going to have to take their chances. What does that mean, exactly? Take their chances? It means that they will be at risk from whale hunters the same as the rest of the humpbacks. What did you mean when you said all that stuff at the Institute about extinction? I meant... He meant... What you said on the tour, that if things keep going the way they are, humpbacks will disappear forever. That's not what he said, farm boy. Admiral, if we were to assume those whales are ours to do with as we please, we would be as guilty as those who caused, past tense, their extinction. I have a photographic memory. I see words. Are you sure? Is it time for a colorful metaphor? You're not one of those guys from the military, are you? Trying to teach whales to retrieve torpedoes or some dipshit stuff like that? No, ma'am. No dipshit. Well, good, that's one thing. I would have let you off right here. Gracie is pregnant. The pickup screams to a halt. All right, who are you? And don't jerk me around anymore. I, I want to know how you know that. We can't tell you that. Please, let me finish. I can tell you that we're not in the military and that we intend no harm towards the whales. Then what? In fact, we may be able to help you in ways that, frankly, you couldn't possibly imagine. Or believe, I'll bet. Very likely. You're not exactly catching us at our best. That much is certain. I have a hunch that we'd all be a lot happier discussing this over dinner. What do you say? You guys like Italian? No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes, I love Italian, and so do you. Yes. We focus on the Plexicor factory, inside. The factory is busy with lots of machines running. McCoy is standing around while Scotty is watching someone work with great interest. A man comes in riding a forklift, wearing a giant I quit smoking button on his chest. Professor Scott, I'm Dr. Nicholas, plant manager. Ah? I'm terribly sorry, but there's been an awful mix-up. Would you believe I was never told about your visit? I tried to clear things up, Professor Scott. I explained you'd come all the way here from Edinburgh on appointment to study methods of manufacturing by Plexicorp. But they don't seem to know anything about it. Don't know anything about it? I find it hard to believe. I've come millions of miles. Thousands, thousands. Thousands of miles on an invited tour for inspection, only to be. Professor Scott. If you just... I demand to see the owners. I demand. Professor Scott, just take it easy. Dr. Nichols has offered us to take to take us around the plant personally. He has? Yes, with pleasure. Well, that's different. Gregory. A forklift drives up. Professor. May my assistant join us? Of course. Don't bury yourself in the pot. We focus on the Plexicorp factory outside. 
Sulu in his glorious cape jacket <laughs> is checking out a helicopter. Also, why is there a helicopter outside a plastics factory? The pilot walks up, not at all suspicious, and overly friendly. Hey, man! Oh, my. Hello. A good-looking ship. Hui 204, isn't it? Right on, right on, right on, man. Do you fly? Oh, here and there. I flew something similar back in my academy days. <laughs> all right, all right. Then this must be some old stuff to you. Old, yes, but interesting. Do you mind if I ask a few questions? I'll do it! We focus on the Plexicore factory, Nichols' office. Well, this is a fine place you have here, Dr. Nichols. Thank you. I must say, Professor, your knowledge of engineering is most impressive. Back home, we call him the Miracle Worker. Indeed. May I offer something, gentlemen? Dr. Nichols, I may be able to offer something to you. Ooh, yes? I notice you're still working with polymers. S still? What else would I be working with? Ah, what else indeed? I'll put it another way. How thick would a piece of your plexiglass need to be at 6 feet by 10 feet to withstand the pressure of an 18,000 cubic feet of water? That's easy, uh, six inches. We carry stuff that big in stock. Aye, I've noticed. Now suppose, just suppose, I were to show you a way to manufacture the wall that would do the same job but be only one inch thick. Would that be worth something to you, eh? You're joking. Perhaps the professor could use your computer. Please. Scotty walks up to the computer and just starts speaking. Computer? Computer? When the computer doesn't respond, McCoy, with a big silly grin on his face, hands Scotty the mouse, which he picks up and holds to his mouth like it's a CB radio. Ah, hello, computer. Nichols, flabbergasted by what's going on in front of him, makes a suggestion. Just use the keyboard. The keyboard? How quaint. Scotty cracks his knuckles and begins typing. For someone who doesn't know how a mouse works, he sure is good on the keyboard. Dot com. What is this? Nichols sits down and has a look on a look at Scotty's formula. He's impressed. Transparent aluminum. That's the ticket, laddie. It, it it would take years just to figure out the dynamics of this matrix. Yes, but you'd be rich beyond the dreams of avarice. So, is it worth something to you, or should I just punch up Claire? No, no, no. no. A female employee comes into the office. Not now, Madeline. She leaves. What exactly did you have in mind? Well, a moment alone, please. McCoy signals to Scotty, and they head off to the corner of Nichols' office. So you realize, of course, if we give him the formula, we're altering the future. Why? How do we not know he didn't invent the thing? Yeah. We focus on Golden Gate Park. Jillian drives onto the grass for some reason. Don't they have laws about vehicles and parks in San Francisco? Spock gets out of the truck. You sure you won't change your mind? Is there something wrong with the one I have? <laughs> Just a little joke. Goodbye, old friend. Wait a minute. How did you know Gracie's pregnant? Nobody knows that. Gracie does. I'll be right back. What? Is he just going to hang around the bushes while we eat? It's his way. As the pickup drives off, Spock disappears in a transporter beam. We focus on an Italian restaurant. Jillian and Kirk are sitting down at a table, 
a waiter is there to take their order. Do you trust me? Implicitly. Good. Large mushroom, pepperoni with extra onions, and a Michelob, please. Great choice. And you, sir? Uh, make that too. The waiter leaves. Well, how does a nice girl like you get to be a cetacean biologist? Just lucky, I guess. You're upset about losing the whales, aren't you? You're very perceptive. How will that be done, exactly? They'll be flown in a special 747 to Alaska and released there. Flown? And that's the last you'll see of them? See, yes, but we'll tag them with radio transmitters on a special frequency so we can keep tabs on them. You know, I could take those whales somewhere where they'd never be hunted. <laughs> you? You can't even get from Sausalito to San Francisco without a lift. If you have such a low opinion of my abilities, how come we're here having dinner? I'm a sucker for hard luck cases. Cheers! Besides, I want to know why you travel around with that ditzy guy who knows that Gracie is pregnant and calls you Admiral. Where could you take them? Hmm. My whales? Where could you take them where they'd be safe? Well, it's not so much a matter of a place as of a time. The time would have to be right now. Why right now? Let's just say that no humpback born in captivity has ever survived. Problem is that they won't be much, much safer at sea because of all the hunting this time of year. So you see that, as they say, is that. Damn. Kirk's communicator beeps. What is that? What's what? You have a pocket pager? Are you a doctor? Kirk's communicator beeps again. He gives in and answers it, annoyed. What is it? I thought I told you to never call me. Sorry, Admiral. I thought you'd like to know. We're beaming them in now. Oh. All right, tell them phasers on stun. Good luck, Kirk. Kirk puts the communicator away. Jillian is on to him. You want to try it from the top? Why don't you tell me when those whales are leaving? Who are you? Who do you think I am? Don't tell me. You're from outer space. No, I'm from Iowa. I only work in outer space. Ah, well, I was close. I mean, I knew outer space was going to come into it sooner or later. The truth? I'm all ears. <laughs> okay, the truth. I am from what on your calendar would be the late 23rd century. I've come back in time to bring two humpback whales with me in an attempt to repopulate the species. Well, why didn't you just say so? I mean, why all the coy disguises? You want the details? Oh, I wouldn't miss this for all the tea in China. When are those whales being released? Okay, what the hell? Your friend was right. Gracie is not only pregnant, she is very pregnant, and at noon tomorrow, when there is sure to be a media circus, the whales get shipped out. Noon tomorrow? Kirk gets up from the table in a panic. Are we leaving? Come on, we don't have much time. The waiter has just arrived with her pizza, and for some reason, the bill as well. Uh, could we have that to go, please? Sure. Who gets the bad news? Don't tell me they don't use money in the 23rd century. Well, we don't. We focus on the USS Enterprise reactor room. There is a seaman doing patrol with a large German shepherd. The shepherd indicates at a flight of stairs, but his handler ignores him and pulls him along. Pan down to discover that Uhura and Chekhov are hiding under those stairs. They sneak over to the reactor and scan it with a couple of different devices. How long? It depends how much shielding there is between us and the reactor. We focus on Golden Gate Park. Jillian drives into the middle of the park again to drop Kirk off. Well, Admiral, that was the briefest dinner I've ever had in my life, and certainly the biggest cockamamie fish story I've ever heard. You asked. Now, you tell me something. George and Gracie's transmitter. What's the radio frequency? Sorry, that's classified. Look, I don't really have a clue who you are. Really. You wouldn't want to show me around your spaceship, would you? Uh, that wouldn't be my first choice, no. Well, there we are. Let me tell you something. I'm here to bring two humpbacks into the 23rd century. If I have to, I'll go to the open sea to get them. But I'd much rather have yours. Better for me. Better for you. It's better for them. 
think about it. Kirk gets out of the truck. Who are you? Think about it, but don't take too long. I'm out of time. If you change your mind, this is where I'll be. Here? In the park? Right. Jillian drives off, hears the transporter sound, stops, and looks back. Kirk has disappeared. We focus on the Bird of Prey cargo bay. Status? The tech will be finished by morning. That's cutting it closer than you know. What about Team 2? No words since Beam in. We can only wait for them to call. Damn. Damn it, we've been so lucky. We have the two perfect whales right in our hands, and if we don't move quickly, we'll lose them. In that event, the probabilities are that our mission would fail. Our mission? Spock, you're talking about the end of every life on Earth. You're half human. Haven't you got any goddamn feelings about that? Spock seems startled by Kirk's remark. <laughs> We focus on the USS Enterprise reactor room. Uhura and Chekhov anxiously watch progress on gathering the photons as another patrol passes. We focus on the USS Enterprise CIC room. Two men are watching some sort of screen. Here it is again! That's too weird, Commander. I thought you gents were running a test program. Yes, sir. But we're apparently getting a power drain, and it just must be coming from somewhere inside the ship. CIC, Command Duty Officer, Commander Rogerson. Yes, Chief, we're tracking that too. What do you make of it? We focus on the USS Enterprise reactor room. Scotty, we're ready for beam out. Scotty, can you hear me? We focus on the USS Enterprise CIC room. Confirmed. Roger that. Manda Commanding Officer, this is to Command Duty Officer Commander Rogerson. We have an intruder in number four MMR. I say again, we have an intruder in number four MMR. We focus on the USS Enterprise reactor room. Scotty, do you read? We focus on the Bird of Prey transporter room. Scotty, Scotty. Lass, I can hardly hear you. My transporter power is down to minimum. I've got to bring you in one at a time. We focus on the USS Enterprise reactor room. Take the collector. You go first. We focus on the Bird of Prey transporter room. Stand by. We're back to the USS Enterprise reactor room. Uhura transports out. Hello? What was that? Hello? <laughs> Come in, please. Scotty, how soon? We focus on the Bird of Prey transporter room. Chekhov, you're breaking up. Please signal again. Chekhov, can you hear me? We focus on the USS Enterprise reactor room. Scotty, now would be a good time. We hear commotion as Master at Arms officers rush in and surround Chekhov. We focus on the Bird of Prey transporter room. Chekhov, I've lost him. And we're back to the USS Enterprise interrogation room. An FBI agent is there to ask Chekhov some questions. Commander Pavel Chekhov, Starfleet, United Federation of Planets. Right, Commander. Is there anything you want to tell us? Like what? Like who you really are and what you're doing here and what these... These things are. I am Pavel Chekhov, Commander in Starfleet, United Federation of Planets, Service Number Six Five Six Eight Five Two Seven D. All right, let's take it from the top. The top of what? Name. My name? No, my name. I do not know your name. You play games with me, Mister, and you're through. I am. May I go now? The agent pauses for a moment and then turns to speak to another agent. What do you think? He's a rusky. 
That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Of course he's a Rusky, but he's a retard or something. You better call Washington. Chekhov jumps up and pulls his phaser on the agents. Don't move. Okay. Make nice. Give us the ray gun. I warn you. If you don't lie on the floor, I will have to stun you. Go ahead. Stun me. I'm very sorry, but it must be the radiation. Chekhov throws the useless phaser to the agent and heads off into the ship. He runs through the ship as he is chased by both the Navy and the FBI. Get him! Get him! Where's that Rusky? Go, go, go! Uh, Come on, vodka. Gangway! Hit the deck! The crew on the deck drops. Chekhov is still running. He starts climbing a bunch of stuff that's laying around, loses his balance, and falls off the side of the ship. He is now laying on the dock, unconscious. Bear down! Get this Corbin over here! We focus on the Bird of Prey bridge. Uhura is scanning for any sign of Chekhov. Any luck? Nothing. Admiral... I should have never left him. You did what was necessary. Keep trying to find him. Scotty, you promised me an estimate on the dilithium crystals. It's going slowly, sir. It'll be well into tomorrow. That's not good enough, Mr. Scott. You've got to do better. We focus on the bird of prey engineering. I'll try, sir. Scotty so hotty out. <laughs> he isn't a wee bit of a schnit, isn't he? He is a man of deep feelings. Aye, what else is new? We focus on the Citation Institute. Jillian arrives and finds the whale tank is empty. She runs back into the building and Bob tries to calm her down. They left last night. We didn't want a mob scene with the press. It wouldn't have been good for them. Besides, we thought it would have been easier on you this way. You sent them away without even letting me say goodbye? Jillian! You son of a bitch! She slaps him and runs off. She gets back into her truck, upset, until something occurs to her. She starts up the truck and speeds away. We focus on Golden Gate Park. Jillian arrives in a hurry to see the Plexicorp helicopter hovering with a sheet of transparent aluminum suspended below it. Admiral! Admiral Kirk! Admiral Kirk! Jillian stares in disbelief as the top half of Scotty appears in midair and the transparent aluminum begins to disappear. Admiral! Admiral Kirk! Admiral Kirk! Jillian runs across the grass and bumps into a cloaked bird of prey falling to the ground. Admiral! Admiral! Admiral Kirk! Can you hear me? Jillian gets to her feet and runs her hands along the cloaked ship in what looks like a magnificent display of mime. They're gone! I need your help! Are you in there? Scotty looks down, sees her, and yells into the ship. Admiral, we have a problem. We focus on the Bird of Prey cargo bay. Jillian can be seen on a monitor. Kirk watches her yell for him and then walks over to a transporter pad. Admiral! Admiral (laughs) Kirk! Can you hear me? Admiral! Admiral Kirk! Can you hear me? Admiral Kirk! Can you hear me? I need your help! We focus on Golden Gate Park. Jillian is beamed up. Oh my god! Ah! We focus on the Bird of Prey transporter room. (laughs) Hello, Alice. (laughs) Welcome to Wonderland. Oh, it's true. Yes, it's true. What you said? Yes, it is. I'm glad you're here, but I must admit you picked a hell of a time to drop in. Take it easy now. We need your help. Is this real? Yes, it's real. Take a look. We focus on the Bird of Prey cargo bay. Kirk is showing Jillian around. Storage tanks for your whales. 
We'll bring them up the same way we brought you. It's called... Admiral, they're gone. Gone? They were taken last night. I wasn't told. They're in Alaska by now. Damn. But they're tagged, like I told you. You can go find them, right? I can't go anywhere. What kind of spaceship is this? It's a spaceship with a missing man. Admiral, full power has been restored. Jillian is a bit surprised to see Spock's pointy ears. Thank you, Mr. Spock. Hello, Doctor. Welcome aboard. Admiral, are you there? Yes, Ahura. What's wrong? I found Chekhov, sir. They're taking him to emergency surgery right now. Uhura, where? Mercy Hospital. Mercy Hospital? That's in the Mission District. They report his condition as critical. He is not expected to survive. Jim, you've got to let me go in there. Don't leave him in the hands of 20th century medicine. Admiral, may I suggest that Dr. McCoy is correct? We must help Chekhov. Is that the logical thing to do, Spock? No. But it is the human thing to do. Right. Kirk turns to Jillian. Will you help us? How? Well, we're gonna have to look like physicians. <laughs> <laughs> we focus on Mercy Hospital corridors. Kirk, McCoy, and Jillian are dressed in scrubs. We'll try down here. You check there. Doctor! What's the matter with you? Kidney. Dialysis. Dialysis? My God, what is this, the dark ages? McCoy reaches into his bag and takes out a pill. Here, you swallow that. And if you have any problems, just call me. Down another hallway, Kirk checks out charts on a clipboard. Here, I've got it. Let's go. Kirk and Jillian catch up to McCoy. He's being held in the security corridor one flight up. His condition is critical. Come on. There is an or- orderly pushing a gurney in front of them. Excuse me, we'll take that. Jillian jumps on the gurney and Kirk throws a blanket over her. The or- orderly doesn't even question this. <clears throat> they rush to an elevator. Hold the door. Emergency. We focus on Mercy Hospital elevator. Two interns are discussing a case. Their conversation catches McCoy's attention. Did you hear anything? Yeah, I was there. I heard the whole thing. Weintraub said radical chemotherapy or she's gonna croak just like that. Well, what about Gottlieb? All he talked about was image therapy or otherwise he cut it out. Unbelievable. You have a different view, Doctor? It sounds like the goddamn Spanish Inquisition. Bad day. They exit the elevator. We focus on Mercy Hospital corridor. There are two policemen guarding the door into a surgical room. Kirk and McCoy attempt to pass with Jillian still on the gurney. Out of the way! We have strict orders. Ow! Damn it, don't you want an acute case on your hands? This woman has intermediate postprandial upper abdominal distension. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. The policeman let them through into the room. We focus on Mercy Hospital operating room. What did you say she's got? Cramps. McCoy walks over to the operating table to check on Chekhov whose procedure is about to begin. The surgical team has no idea what's going on. Who are you? Why aren't you masked? Who are these people? I don't know. What the hell is that? What are you doing? McCoy is scanning Chekhov with his medical tricorder. Aaron of the Middle Mingeal Artery. What's your degree in dentistry? How do you explain slow pulse, low respiratory rate, and coma? Fundoscopic examination! Fundoscopic examination is unrevealing in these cases. A simple evacuation of the expanding epidural hematoma will relieve the pressure. 
My God, man, drilling holes in his head is not the answer. The artery must be repaired. Now put away your butcher's knives and let me save this patient before it's too late. I'm going to have you and your southern accent removed. (laughs) (laughs) Doctors, such unprofessional behavior. Into that little room, please. Kirk pulls out his phaser. What is that? A gun? What is this? I have no idea. (laughs) Kirk gets the whole surgical team into the scrub room and fuses the lock of the door with his phaser. He melted the lock! (laughs) We're dealing with Mazemia. Chemotherapy. Fundoscopic examinations. McCoy throws a bunch of 20th century surgical tools to the floor and puts a 23rd century medical device on Chekhov's forehead. Come on, Chekhov. Wake up. Pavel, can you hear me? He's coming around, Jim. Pavel, talk to me. Name, rank. Chekhov. Pavel. Rank. Edmund? We focus on Mercy Hospital corridor. The two policemen are still outside the door. How's the patient, doctor? He's gonna make it. He? You came in with a she? One little mistake. The policemen rush into the operating room, knowing something is up. (laughs) We focus on Mercy Hospital operating room. The policemen attempt to free the surgical staff from the scrub room. Get us out of here! They've taken the patient! Get some help! We focus on the Mercy Hospital corridor. Kirk, McCoy, and Jillian flee, pushing Chekhov on the gurney. The policemen chase them. Hold it! Police! Chekhov starts to sit up, but Kirk pushes him back down. Not now, Pavel. Hold it! Hold it! Look out! Look out! The dialysis patient we saw earlier is now being pushed through the hallway in a wheelchair by a team of puzzled doctors. The doctor gave me a pill and I grew a new kidney! It's fully functional! Fully functional? With the police still chasing them, they run towards an elevator knocking down a poor man in a full leg cast. By the time the police get to the elevator, the doors have closed and the officers rush down the stairs to beat the elevator to the next floor. They pull out their guns, but when the doors open... The elevator is empty. We focus on Golden Gate Park. Kirk, McCoy, Chekhov, and Jillian beam in. Where would the whales be by now? Please, do you have a chart on board? I'll show you. No, 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 no. All I need is the radio frequency to track them. What are you talking about? I'm coming with you. You can't. Our next stop is the 23rd century. I don't care. I've got nobody here. I have to help those whales. I have no time to argue with you, or even tell you how much you've meant to us. The radio frequency. Please. The frequency is 401 megahertz. Thank you. For everything. Scotty, beam me up. Surprise! Jillian leaps, putting her arms around Kirk's neck and transports with him. We focus on the Bird of Prey bridge. Spock, where the hell is the power you promised me? One damn minute, Admiral. I'm ready, Spock. Let's go find Georgie and Gracie. Sulu? I'm trying to remember how this works. I got used to a Huey. You tricked me. You need me. Ready, sir. Take a seat. Now, Mr. Sulu. We focus on Golden Gate Park. Two joggers are running along the path as the bird of prey starts to lift off. They are blown into a tree. What the hell was that? We focus on the bird of prey bridge. Cloaking device is stable? 
All systems normal. Stabilize energy reserve. Report, Helm. Maintaining impulse climb. Wing 5 by 0. Helm steady. Advise reaching 10,000. Steer 310. 310, I. Uhura, scan for the whales. 401 megahertz. Scanning, sir. 10,000 MSL, Admiral. Wing to cruise configuration. Full impulse power. Aye, sir. 310 to the Bering Sea, ETA, 12 minutes. Scotty, are the whale tanks secure? Aye, sir. But I've never beamed up 400 tons before. 400 tons? It's not just the whales. It's also the water. Yes, of course. The whales. Any contact? Negative, sir. McCoy heads over to Spock. You, uh, you present the appearance of a man with a problem. Your perception is correct, Doctor. In order for us to return to the exact moment which we left the 23rd century, I have used our journey back through time as a reference, calculating the coefficient of elapsed time in relation to the acceleration curve. Naturally. So what's your problem? Acceleration is no longer a constant. Well, then you're gonna have to take your best shot. Best shot? Guess, Spock. Your best guess. Guessing is not in my nature, Doc. Well, nobody's perfect. McCoy gives Spock a cocky grin and walks away. Spock raises an eyebrow, contemplating what he said. Jillian is sitting with Uhura, helping listen for the whales. That's it! That's it! Affirmative. Contact with the whales. Bearing? Bearing 327. Range 600 nautical. Put them on screen. How can you do that? On screen. <laughs> Admiral, I have a signal closing in on the whales. Bearing 328 degrees. Let's see it. What kind of ship is that? A whaling ship, Doctor. Are we too late? Full power descent, Mr. Sulu. Aye, sir. Full power descent. The whaler, having spotted the whales, loads a harpoon and prepares to fire. Ten seconds, sir. When one of the whales surface, the harpoon is fired. But it hits an invisible wall with a clunk. And drops into the ocean. The bird of prey decloaks directly in front of the whaling ship, causing them to immediately reverse course. Alright, Scotty, it's up to you. We focus on the bird of prey cargo bay. Ten seconds, Admiral. Five, four, three, two, one. Admiral, there be whales here. We focus on the bird of prey bridge. Well done, Mr. Scott. How soon can we, we be ready for warp speed? Full power now, sir. If you will, Mr. Sulu. Aye, sir. Warp speed. Mr. Sulu, you have the con. I'm going to take our guest down to have a look at her whales. Oh. Mr. Spock, have you accounted for the variable mass of whales and water in your re-entry program? Mr. Scott cannot give me exact figures, Admiral. So I will make a guess. A guess? You? Spock? That's extraordinary. Kirk and Jillian leave the bridge. <laughs> Spock turns to McCoy. I don't think he understands. No, Spock. He means that he feels safer about your guesses than most other people's facts. Then you're saying it is a compliment. It is. Ah, uh, then I will try to make the best guess I can. We focus on the bird of prey cargo bay. The whales are in their tank. <laughs> Uh, 
They say the sea is cold, but the sea contains the hottest blood of all. Whales weep not. D.H. Lawrence. You know, it's ironic. When man was killing these creatures, he destroyed his own future. The beasties seem happy to see you, Doctor. I hope you like our little aquarium. A miracle, Mr. Scott. A miracle? That's yet to come. What does that mean? It means that our chances of getting home are not too good. You might have lived longer if you'd stayed where you belong. I belong here. I am a whale biologist. Suppose by some miracle you do get them through. Who in the 23rd century knows anything about humpback whales? You have a point. What was that? Admiral, I think you'd better get up here. We're having a power fall off. Stay with them. I'm on my way. Hold on tight, lassie. It gets bumpy from here, if you know what I mean. We focus on Bird of Prey Bridge. Warp 7.5. 7.9. Shield at the maximum. We focus on the Bird of Prey cargo bay. Is there Sulu? That's all I can give you? We focus on the Bird of Prey bridge. Can we make breakaway speed? Hardly, Admiral. I cannot even guarantee we will escape the sun's gravity. I shall attempt to compensate by altering our trajectory. Warp 8. 8.1. Maximum speed, sir. Admiral, I need thrust control. Acceleration thrusters at Spock's command. Steady. Steady. Now. The bird of prey slingshots around the sun. Did... did breaking thrusters fire? They did, Admiral. Then where the hell are we? The probe? Condition report. Spock? It did, Admiral. Computers are not functional. The mains are down, sir. Auxiliary power is not responding. Switch to manual control. Mr. Sulu? I have no control, sir. My god, Jim! Where are we? Out of control and blind as a bat. We focus on Starfleet Command. We're back to just minutes before the crew traveled back in time. Good guess, Spock. Get him back! Get him back! The large window collapses again. Look! It's the bird of prey. They are falling fast. They're heading for the bridge! They just narrowly miss crashing into the Golden Gate Bridge. We focus on the Bird of Prey Bridge. Ground cushion! Keep the nose up if you can! They make an emergency landing in the water. We're in the water! Blow the hatch! You got us to the right place, Spock. Now all we have to do is get the whales out before we sink. Abandon ship! Scotty, do you hear me? Scotty! Move! Move! See to the safety of all hands. I will! The crew begins to evacuate the ship. We focus on the Bird of Prey cargo bay. The cargo bay is filling with water, and the whales are trapped. Lassie, get my arm! I've got it! Scotty! Kirk is outside the cargo bay doors. Admiral! Help! I'm here, Scotty, I'm here! Kirk gets the cargo bay doors open, releasing Jillian and Scotty. You're gonna be alright. The whales are trapped. They'll drown. There's no power to the bay doors. Explosive override? It's underwater, and there's no way to reach it. You go on ahead. Close the hatch. Admiral, you'll be trapped. Go on. Kirk takes off his jacket, swims underwater, and operates the manual release for the external cargo bay doors, releasing the whales. We focus on the bird of prey exterior floating in the bay. Kirk swims through the open doors after the whales and joins his crewmates outside the ship. 
Did you see them? Ooh. Jillian points to the water just as the whales swim by. There! Why don't they answer? Why don't they sing? The whales begin to sing. The probe retracts its ball and moves off. The rain stops and the clouds recede. We focus on Starfleet Command. Mr. President, we have power! We focus on the bird of prey exterior, floating in the bay. In the bay, the whales, the crew, and Jillian frolic, throwing each other into the water. Splashy, Laughing. Oh my, so funny. We focus on the Federation Council Chamber. The Council is now in session. If you will all take your seats, bring in the accused. The crew enters from a side door. Spock joins them from the stands. Captain Spock, you do not stand accused. Mr. President, I stand with my shipmates. As you wish. The charges and specifications are conspiracy, assault on Federation officers, theft of Federation property, namely the Starship Enterprise, sabotage of the USS Excelsior, willful destruction of Federation property, specifically the aforementioned USS Enterprise, and finally, disobeying direct orders from Starfleet Command, Admiral Crook. How do you plead? On behalf of all of us, Mr. President, I'm authorized to plead guilty. So entered, because of certain mitigating circumstances, all charges but one are summarily dismissed. (laughs) The remaining charge, disobeying orders of a superior officer, is directed solely at Admiral Kirk. I'm sure the Admiral will recognize the necessity of keeping discipline in any chain of command. I do, sir. James T. Kirk, it is the judgment of the Council that you'll be reduced in rank to Captain, and that, as a consequence of your new rank, you'll be given the duties of which you have repeatedly demonstrated unswerving ability, the command of a starship. The crowd claps and murmurs amongst themselves. Silence! Captain Kirk, you and your crew have saved this planet from our own short-sightedness, and we are forever in your debt. Prolonged applause and cheers from all those present. Oh, I'm so Yay. happy for you. I can't tell you. Thank you so much. Jillian starts to leave. Wait a minute. Where are you going? You're going to your ship. I'm going to mine. Science vessel. I've got 300 years of catch-up learning to do. You mean this is goodbye? Why does it have to be goodbye? Well, like they say in your century, I don't even have your telephone number. <laughs> How will I find you? Don't worry. I'll find you. She gives him a kiss on the cheek. See you around the galaxy. And we never see her again. (laughs) On the other side of the room, Spock approaches his father. Father, I am returning to Vulcan within the hour. I would like to take my leave of you. It was most kind of you to make this effort. It was no effort. You are my son. Besides, I am most impressed with your performance in this crisis. Most kind. As I recall, I opposed your enlistment in Starfleet. It is possible that judgment was incorrect. Your associates are people of good character. They are my friends. Yes, of course. Do you have a message for your mother? Yes. Tell her. I feel fine. Live long and prosper, father. Live long and prosper, my son. We 
focus on the shuttlecraft. The crew is flying around the space dock, heading to their new ship. The bureaucratic mentality is the only constant in the universe. We'll get a freighter. With all respect, Doctor, I'm counting on Excelsior. Excelsior? Why in God's name would you want that bucket of bullets? The ship is a ship. Eh, but there you say, sir. Thy will be done. They approach a shiny new Constitution-class starship, NCC-1701A, a new Enterprise. My friends, we've come home. We focus on the Enterprise A bridge. Helm ready, Captain. All right, Mr. Sulu. Let's see what she's got. And they head off into space at warp speed. And that concludes our reading of Star Trek for the Voyage Home. Wow, what? That was something, everybody. Let's introduce our great, fantastic cast. Uh, well, here in the room, I, I'm, I'm Dave Mater, Jane Mater, Jeff Mater, uh, bringing you various parts tonight. Uh, great job, everybody here. Bringing in ne- next, we have our Spock. We have ah. Tom Mott Tyrell. Great job, Mott. Nice. Love nice. the headband. We also have our Captain Kirk as well as our uh, Commander Uhura uh, and many other roles and narrator uh, in Ashley, Kevin and Ashley. Fantastic. Well done. Great job. We have Jody Simpson in the role of uh, Captain Montgomery Scott as our, uh, our surly Scotty down there with the whales. Hello, Dave. <laughs> and also we have Michael Chan and Jessica Chan. Uh, Michael playing the role of Sulu and oh uh, Sarek and, and many, many others. And Jessica playing the role of Amanda Grayson and uh, most notably as Jillian, Dr. Jillian Taylor. Great job, both of you. And Jamil Robinson in the role of the Federation president, <laughs> garbage man number two, police officer number two, often often was doing dialogue with me tonight in some of these more secondary roles and tertiary roles. Wow. So, okay. Yep. So that was our first two hour read, first movie. Oh, how did everyone feel? Tired. Good. Good. Yeah. Jamil, yeah, this is your first time great. doing this at all. So, yeah. Um, I lost my place in the script multiple times. <laughs> I'm just yeah. like, gotta find it again. <laughs> hey, hey, we lost our connection multiple times. That's the times. only time that ever happened. <laughs> yeah, it has never yeah. happened. I know. Yeah, you, normally, you, Ma, you were right in there quick. That was good. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I went, I don't know. I how it feels like. Well, I thought the, the lines that like she missed. <laughs> We're getting edited in anyway, so I just read them. <laughs> or I thought you were saying, oh, I, well, I thought I did them better. So I'm, I'm happy to keep months standing. I'm sure it was excellent. We're not. Who's that imposter? Yeah. I just needed that to get a, 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 a lot. That, that, that was the point when the production started going a little off. <laughs> we were pretty serious <laughs> until that point. <laughs> I couldn't but help like, it. I, I could have His like, next I thing was, I have a question. I couldn't help <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? I literally thought the exact same thing before you said it. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah, he was getting a little bit worried there about uh, maybe this date he was working on, but he never saw her again, so he didn't get his t- <laughs> telephone number. Oh, mom so. says, outstanding. Everyone was great. Ashley Millard, excellent narrator. Uh, coming yeah. from Beth Mater uh, over the text, so she was l- listening there. This yeah. is her favorite movie. I uh, great J- J- Jane as McCoy, Jeff as Chekhov, me as a bunch of people, and it was great. I like, I know, like, it was really long. The only thing I, I would say I really regret is I, I could have put more sounds in. Well, the sounds are great, the, the sounds, sounds were excellent. And thank yeah. you, thank you for that little cameo. That <laughs> no, yes, I know. No, yeah. I, I was like, because you sent over um, your daughter's uh, audition. I was like, okay, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put this in right at the right time. And it was right before you had to go. So <laughs> it was perfect. It was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, can I say that I enjoyed the snazzy um, transition music? 
where I danced yeah. everything like ah. yeah every, uh, we were dancing too yeah <laughs> yeah yeah we were yeah. using uh, there was some uh, 80s transition music and some different things going on some things were maybe overused in the sound department <laughs> mom says she loved the check off and FBI agency well that was me and Jeff so it would make it's sense not yeah, Jeff, what, what, what's Jeff your mom, but, but ask your mom who her favorite was obviously of those two. Oh. Oh, which oh, which son yeah. did a better job? Who was the better son? Who gave the better performance? Who was the better son? Jeff, Jeff, Jeff was better. rocking it. Time. I'm that time against my Scotty. That's what I, I want to know. Well, she hasn't. Maybe she doesn't. She. What, what I don't know. She doesn't think she has anything against it. She. I. I she She's never like, heard my oh, Scotty. Oh, I went underneath yeah. the tunnel. I'm sorry. Your poor Scotty is poorful, Dave. It's the most it's poorful. Poorful. It's poorful. Poorful. Yeah, it's what he controls. So. <laughs> Where is Jeff? Put him up, like up on the can. He's like a fucking drunk Keebler elf. It's <laughs> yeah, if you go back and listen to Who Mourns for Adonais, uh, a couple of uh, Okay, hold, hold on here. Get get a line out of the script and say it as Scotty. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's Odin, you don't want to hear it. No, you don't want to hear it. You do not want to hear it. It was even worse than like me trying. Okay, we were like, Book sixty feet <laughs> <Yeah. Lord>. Wow! <laughs> I suppose we could. I'm not great, but I'm better than that. Like, you sound oh like. Oh my god! Our, when our, he our, did our. that, we were everybody would crack up of just when we'd see his lines coming <laughs> <Come> up. up. <laughs> like, like, um, he sounds like our aunt Izzy, which I know it's not funny. Scooty, either. we've got to find some room back wheels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it wasn't good. Okay, I'm not meant to play Scotty. No. Um, uh, like I have so many nice things to say about so many people tonight. Uh, so many of the, uh, all of you did great. It was like, uh, but uh, it was it took took the whole group to bring it together. Um, it was that was just a lot of fun. I'm glad we fun. we ended on a big bang. Uh, Jamil, thank you for coming in on this one. Being this yeah. first one is the yeah. longest yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so Thanks no, we, we hope you like, uh, again I'm next like season. This character again? I'm like I don't remember how I did the president. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure every single time I did the president sounded completely different. It, it, it's fine. My Scotty sometimes went to like Indian accent. He was sometimes <laughs> like I heard a poo. Oh, no. <laughs> a poo. A poo. A poo. A poo. Yeah, there was definitely some Indian in there. At one point, I'm like, wait a second, it's Scotty. Hold on. What <laughs> <laughs> are my characters? Uh, not in India. India. Oh. Tourist man. Yeah, he oh, was. Yeah. Oh yeah, Taurus Man was great too. I love Taurus Man. There was so many great parts. Uh, I, I I especially have to give a, a huge shout out here to Kevin Millard, who was Kirk and had a lot of friggin' dialogue. Yeah, mm-hmm. well done. Uh, the star of our show, who uh, really brought it. It was that, that was it was a lot of dialogue, and you kept it uh, like that same energy the whole way through. So I really got especially. Uh, Call that out. You know that Kevin Millard energy. That Kevin Millard energy. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit not enough, but it's good. Okay. <laughs> I thought I thought the one thing I think you should have done, Dave, was when it it was all those scenes in the Italian restaurant. I yeah. thought you should have played scenes from Italian restaurant. No. Uh, ten Billy Joel. Yeah, oh, I should all ten minutes. No. Just a just a bottle of red. I should, or I could have played like Lady in the Tramp or something. Like there was, there was, there was, there was, there was choices. <laughs> have we rewatched the movie recently? Where were the two pizzas? And they were supposed to be large, but they were like really small. They're like pizzas. Yeah, yeah, he brought. Yeah. They he, each ordered a large they pizza. They each ordered a large yes. pizza and a beer. He brought two beers, and then he comes over later with one pizza and a check. Hold on, hold on. The most important thing about all this is who the fuck drinks Michelob? <laughs> well, it was uh, the 80s. Yeah. I kind of wish you put that in the narration. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 an excuse. I, I remember the one senior. time like I was He's into drinking whales. Michelob by like this creek was like some bad kids. <laughs> <laughs> I should have substituted it for like 50 or something. That would have been funny. I got stuck on the fact that he entered the ship with the pizza box, but then when he went into where all the crew was, there was no pizza. He did not share. (laughs) He did not hand out pizza to anybody else. 
he's, right. he's in a decontamination room just stuffing his face. <laughs> <laughs> and and apparently I'm eight years old because oh, Ashley man. said semen and I laughed oh, for like God. 15 minutes. Dude, I was not- not- he would not like, stop Steven. laughing through my entire narration. Oh, Did you know it's semen? When I said semen, when I said semen. You didn't say semen. No, but you said semen. That's what it is. Semen. Yes, that's why it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it was wrong, just funny. Yeah, you said it like a medical report. <laughs> that's how it's pronounced. I know. Yes. I know, and it's and that's hilarious. why we all giggle. Semen. Uh, you said duty. <laughs> I laugh at that too. All the time. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the show here on the air. Uh great job, everybody. I'm gonna kind of take you off screen now. So uh yep. do, 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 and come back. And I just want to say thank you to everybody here on the cast, uh, especially Kevin and Ashley. We put a ton of work in on this script every week. Hey, um and you. do a great job. Hey, and and all those who and uh, and Jody who helped me source a bunch of sounds tonight, Jane who did some some proofing on the script and has helped with various things all season jeff uh the whole crew the whole cast uh michael and jessica and everybody that bring this together ma you're all it's it's i don't know it's I, it's all for fun it's all to make ourselves laugh but i really enjoy it i think we're going to kind of look back on this years from now and really uh i hope we look back finally we'll jeff, jeff, like, are you any more jeff, more sports. <laughs> on the sports back there jeff we're still in the air we're trying to have a, a tender moment here <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, that's on brand i know that's on brand hey uh uh, yeah. Jamil, do, I, know, have a no, I know. Pizza, I, didn't, I, didn't I didn't watch it at all. One. I didn't watch it at all, Jeff. Don't ruin yeah. it for him, Jeff. No, I already yeah. know who won. Oh, okay. Okay. okay I don't there was no talking. doubt. <laughs> Repping my oh, team. I don't know. I was done like 15 minutes ago. It's like, like okay. order, 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 order. All right, I'm going to be like the Federation president here. And be like, order, like, silence. Like, silence. <laughs> demoted to captain. Okay. So, um, we will be back in 2021 for start season two of Star Trek Radio Theater. Uh, start date to be determined. We're going to figure that out. But we're, we're at least taking a few weeks off over Christmas to uh, recharge our battery. And uh, and just, you know, I'm, I, I won't be stressing Jane out. I got to get sounds done every weekend. So um, I, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, but we're going to keep going here for a few more weeks on our other podcast. On, on Tuesdays, we do Star Trek Deep Space Nine. That has Jamil. That has Ashley, Kevin, and Jeff. Uh, we're all we're talking about Deep Space Nine every week. We're in season two. Join along. We're going to be talking about it for the next three and a half years, and we're getting through all the bad episodes. So this is a great time to join to, to like really hop on. Uh, Wednesdays we do original series rewatches. Jody, Adam Woodward, my dad, Jeff. Uh, we talk track. about we yeah, head tracks. We talk uh, next week. We're talking about Amok time, where we're we're we're, we're, Vulc- yeah. where Spock gets horny for the first time. A little bit of Vulcan. on Earth. And on Thursdays, we're talking Star Trek Discovery. That Michael and Adam and I, we talk about Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> Terra Firma Part One was last Thursday. Terra Firma Part Two. Uh, this this Thursday, where where it's a great season of Star Trek Discovery. If you haven't checked out that show, this is a great season to get into it because it's kind of a whole reboot of the show. And uh, our whole Radio Theater catalog. We did twenty six of these, I think, throughout the whole year. If you uh, plus like the original pilot we did. So um, really amazing. Uh, really uh, had a lot of fun, and I uh, can't wait to uh, bring to the next level next year so uh that's it and uh we will see you next time we'll see you in 2020 on this particular version of the podcast but on the others we'll see you next week and check out our other channels super made brothers podcasting trivial debates all that kind of stuff all right uh merry christmas happy holidays happy hanukkah uh happy kwanzaa to be all those things that are coming uh and uh and happy new year as we as we as we look to get past this pandemic year mm-hmm. okay. Bye. All right, Bye. have a good one. Bye.